Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my big brother, Pastor Morgan. Hey guys, what's up? <laughs> Today we have a very special guest, and he is an actor, producer, writer. He was a rabbi, minister, and he also is a Messianic Jew. And he has been in the Chosen series. He played the disciple of Nicodemus, a Pharisee. So without further ado, it's my honor to welcome Steve Shermet. Steve, thanks so much for joining us today. It's totally my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, Morgan, do you want to pray for our listeners? Yeah, let's do it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for everyone listening, God. I pray that this would not just be uh, to build a podcast or to uh, just get our voices out there because we want to be heard, but I pray that everything that um, is said here today would be of you. And thank you for Steve joining us. Please uh, bless him and encourage him. I pray that just as he's going to bless many people uh, by sharing his testimony and the things that you have done in his life, I pray that uh, he would be refreshed as well. And I just pray, God, that you would lead us. And uh, as I prayed earlier, that your Holy Spirit would be here, that we wouldn't try uh, to do all this stuff in our own strength, but that we would be led by you. And I just thank you, God. Um, for uh, as we're, you know, he, he was a, he's a Jew, and but he's found you, the Messiah. And so I just pray, God, that you would show us how we can, um, how we can pray for the Jews, how we can love them, how we should talk to them, God, and that you'll give us uh, insight on, in that as well. And so we give you this time, and uh, we just pray that it will be blessed. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we like to always remind our listeners that this is a conversation. It's not just an interview. So Steve is going to just share a little bit of his testimony and talk about like the Chosen series. And Morgan and I are just going to jump in and ask some mm-hmm. questions throughout it. But um, we also want you have a really amazing resume and a lot of things you've done. I was just looking at it. I was like, oh, my goodness, he did this and that. And so anyway, just before we get into your testimony, can you share a little bit of who you are and what you do? If you could just summarize all the stuff and anything you miss, I'll just, I'll mention it and see if it's true. <laughs> I'm like, what, what's she have in front of her? <laughs> <It's exciting. laughs> what is this yeah. resume she speaks yeah. of? You have to believe everything on what you see online and the internet. So. He's like, that's not why I right? did. Those are just my parts in certain movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. no. The astronaut. You never know. I haven't seen what you're seeing. So. Yeah. So I spent um, probably 30, real close to 30 years of my life in full-time ministry. Uh, I did work within the Jewish community and also within uh, the non-Jewish community. So I was a Messianic rabbi for about 27 years and the pastor of a non-denominational church for about, I think it was 15 years. I'd have to do the math. Mm -hmm. And uh, those overlapped. Mm -hmm. So I kept myself... Plenty busy and plenty yeah. stressed. Oh, yeah. We understand our dad's a, a and, pastor, so we're in full-time ministry. It's, yeah. it's a lot. It is. And so um, towards the end of my tenure there, um, I uh, rediscovered acting. So that was something I did in high school and after high school, but I was looking for a new hobby, something to, you know, take me away from yeah. it all. Yeah. <laughs> And when I stumbled back into acting, it was like I remembered how much I used to love it. And so um, I read up on how to do it professionally, you know, hit the Internet and said, well, I need a resume. I need a a demo reel and I need headshots. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know what, for a demo reel, I could use some of the footage from the television shows I hosted as a pastor and a rabbi. And I get my daughter's got a, my daughter in law's got a new camera. I can get headshots, mm-hmm. and for a resume, I, I'll put the stuff I used to do in high school. So I got that stuff put together. I sent it off to uh, some talent agents up in the Phoenix area, and one of them said, "Hey, yeah, we'd like to represent you." And that started me uh, in my new acting career on camera, uh, film, and television. Wow. So you were in acting when you were a kid, you're saying, and then you got back into yeah, in, in high school and after high school, I did uh, theater, singing, dancing, that oh, okay. sort of thing, plays and, and musicals, yeah. and, and yeah. I loved it. You know, I was taking voice lessons and piano lessons and dance lessons, mm-hmm. but I'd never done it on camera. Yeah, 
and uh, it's different, mm-hmm. you know. So what was that gap from acting then to when you started acting again? That was one wife, <laughs> four kids, three or four congregations. Yeah. <laughs> uh. yeah, I am. I planted Book of Life Community Church in Tucson and Congregation Bessar Shalom in Tucson. Mm-hmm. And I helped start a church in Mexico in Nogales and a Messianic Fellowship up in Scottsdale and a few other things, uh, you know, the Association of Messianic Congregations. And then I preached at local churches and traveled to do some preaching. So I kept busy, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So what was it, that transition from being a pastor? Or was, would they also call you a rabbi? or, or... Yeah, on Saturdays I was called <laughs> rabbi, on Sundays I was well, called pastor. <laughs> so what was that transition going back into acting? Do you feel like the Lord was just calling you out of ministry, or was it just like a lot and a day of rest <laughs> yeah <laughs> how yeah that's what it was i was yeah. tired i needed a rest and i just felt i was at the point where i couldn't do this anymore mm-hmm. and so i did the acting for a few years while i did pastoring and you know the messianic rabbi but when i stopped doing ministry retired from it the acting was mm-hmm. still there so it's not like i don't want people to think i gave up the one for the mm-hmm. other it was just, I burnt out. I was done with ministry full time. And I had this acting thing that I was already doing. So I just pursued it. You know, I continued mm-hmm. to pursue it. Yeah. And real quick before we move on, but your Jewish background. So um, can you tell people what that means to be a Messianic Jew? And and when did that change? Or have you always been that? Or Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I was raised in, in a Jewish home. Um Reformed Jewish as a child, conservative Jewish as mm-hmm. a child. And uh, Jesus was never on my radar. I knew he was the other people's religion, you know, the one that, that the non-Jews mm-hmm. followed. And that wasn't something I would have ever even considered an mm-hmm. option. But sometimes towards the end of high school, maybe right after high school, I went on a spiritual quest. Uh, I just kind of thought life was... Life sucked, and I was empty inside and wanted to know, is this it? Is there any purpose for life? Why are we here? Why am Mm -hmm. I here? And is there any hope out there? And when you ask yourself, why am I here? How do you get an answer to that? So in my brain, well, let me see if there's a God. I didn't even believe in a God. So I started to read the Jewish Bible, um, the Old Testament, which is... The same Old Testament Christians use, but of course, to us, that wasn't the Old Testament. That was just our Bible. And uh, it started speaking to my soul. You know, the spirit I didn't even know I had was responding to what Mm. was in there. It was like, you're a believer. You probably know what I'm talking Mm. about. Non-believers were like, yeah. (laughs) But it was was touching a part of me that I didn't even know was there. And the more I read it, the more I came, became convinced that it was true and real, that God was true and real. But at the same time, the book was full of laws, holiness, do's and don'ts. Mm-hmm. Reading the, the uh, law of Moses is very convicting. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, okay, there is a God, and I'm in trouble with him. <laughs> I pretty much learned those at the yeah. same time. So, okay, there's a God, I'm in trouble with him. How do I get right with him? Well, according to the Bible, the Jewish Bible, you have to offer a sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. And that kind of left me in a hole, didn't yeah, it? Like, I can't really do that. <laughs> yeah, I can't really do that. So there's a God. Now I know it. And now I'm in trouble with him. And there's nothing I can do about it. So what are some things that they do? But, Sorry for interrupting you. But what do they do then? Like, um, if they can't sacrifice, make those sacrifices. Yeah. what do Jewish people, like, what is the alternative to that? Well, Judaism basically says there's no temple that's on God, not on us. We can't be held responsible for that. So we'll pray and do good deeds, and that'll suffice until there's a Mm -hmm. temple. That's that's the line. Because they're getting everything prepared. I don't mean that disrespectfully, but that's what they teach, you know. Because they're getting everything prepared. I think they they pretty much have everything prepared to build the temple. They have all the pieces, right? So... Yeah, yeah I, it can go up very quickly. Last I read, and this was several years ago, they were working on prefabbing mm-hmm. it. But I don't know how far how far they got mm-hmm. into that. I have visited the Temple Institute in Jerusalem that shows the implements that the priests will mm-hmm. use that they're making for inside the temple. And that's yeah. pretty cool. But 
And for us as believers in Jesus, that's a diversion. Mm-hmm. We don't need the temple. He's our sacrifice. Yeah. So what, how old are you when that happened and that changed for you? I was around 18. Oh. Yeah, 18, 19, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. And like you said, you were just broken. And most of the people who share their testimony on Calvary Conversations, you see there's a point where they're just like, Mm -hmm. This life has nothing to offer me anymore. I need to find the meaning of life. And Mm -hmm. so that brokenness is where God puts us. And then we'll talk later about the chosen. But you see that. You see that with Mary. You see that with Matthew. You see that with all of them. With Peter, they were at a at like a standstill, a time where they're just like, I don't know what else to do. And so it's just cool that that happened to you. But what are some other things growing up as a Jewish boy? You know, did you have... um, what is it called when you're 15? Bar mitzvah. Well, did you all of that <laughs> or did you go to synagogue? What did that like? We'll go back a little bit from your testimony growing up. But what did that look like right. growing up in your family? Hmm. Yeah, I went to Hebrew school. Um, Might have been Sunday afternoon. I don't remember when it was Saturday afternoon. Once a week, I had to go in and, and learn that sort of thing. And then as I was getting approaching 13 in my 12th hmm. year, I had to take... Um, classes with a cantor mm. and the t- cantor teaches you how to chant the proper Hebrew prayers because the bar mitzvah is supposed to be you're becoming a man in the Jewish community so you're now responsible for doing the Jewish prayers that the men do in the mm-hmm. synagogue yeah. okay. so I studied that stuff you also yeah count that as uh, like I know it's not like a biblical thing age of accountability but kind of like where you can now be judged based off what you know is is that have anything to do with it or not at all. I just, <laughs> um, in a sense, it's a different, it's a different, you do become a Jewish adult at that point, though. I'd never heard of it growing up as equating the age of mm-hmm. accountability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jewish people look at redemption and salvation yeah, differently, mm-hmm. you know, and the average Jewish person doesn't really consider that as part of their daily bread. Yeah. If you know mm-hmm. what I mean, once a year on the day of atonement, unless the Holy spirit does something in your heart, like he did with me through the reading of the Torah, you know, the, the Old Testament. Then you see things differently. Did you get a lot of uh, persecution as being a Jew? Because we know, well, if you look at Israel, there's yeah. they're getting a lot of attacks and everything like that. But I know it's a little different in America, yeah. but did you get like verbal uh, persecution or anything like that? Not really? No, I spent most of, much of my formative years in either a Jewish community, mm-hmm. not exclusively, but where there were a lot of Jewish people yeah. around or where the people were just very open minded and liberal and didn't care about that yeah. sort of thing. Um, I, I experienced small tastes of it as an adult mm-hmm. and uh, probably got just as much anti-Semitism from people who call themselves Christians as anyone mm-hmm. else. Oh. Yeah. And then I got, you know, persecution for being a Jew who believes in yeah. Jesus from the other side. Yeah. So <laughs> that was <laughs> yeah. fun. Man. Yeah, that that is a hard but spot. It was, you know, small potatoes. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. It's unpleasant. Nobody mm-hmm. likes it. But it's not like my life was threatened on a daily basis. I wasn't being punched and beat up all the time. So it, uh, I, I don't want to make it more than it yeah. was either. People suffer for real. Now, I didn't. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So what would you say to like the Christians giving you a hard time as a Jew? Because mm-hmm. the Bible clearly says to pray you know, Amen. for Israel and everything. So... What what do you say to Christians about that topic? It's been a long time since I've had that conversation with an anti-Semitic so-called mm-hmm. Christian. But I believe if you're an anti-Semite, you're not yeah. a Christian. Yeah. You can't hate your brother who yeah. you have seen and love the God you have not seen, First yeah. John. You know, hate in your heart to me means you're just not a believer. You might call yourself one, but you're not. But if you're open to conversation, then yeah, I would point out that Jesus is Jewish. Yeah. So if you hate yep. Jews, you yeah. hate Jesus. Yes, exactly. You're know? <laughs> yep. yeah. straightforward, yeah. right? Exactly. And then I want to, so the resume part that I was talking about, the stuff I heard, where does this come to play? So 18, you got saved. And then what did you do after that? I, I saw some things of um, your police officer, or was that right? Boy, you I really did. did you and then I saw something like you? scuba instructor. <laughs> I saw, or scuba something. I saw like mixed martial arts. I saw... Oh, what was it? I don't know. Some other stuff that I was like, that's cool. Or like stuff with firearms. We really like, you know, firearms and all that. <laughs> yeah. But what did, what did that so, look like for you after you got saved when you're 18? 
right around that time when I was 18, I did go into the police academy. I was going to be a cop. I uh, graduated towards the top of my class and started looking for a job in law enforcement. Finally hooked up with the um, sheriff's department in uh, Imperial County, sort of. <laughs> they uh, called me and said, we have a hiring freeze. Mm. So as soon as the county frees up the funds, you're on. Well, when will that be? Well, it could be a week, could be a month, could be a year. We don't know. Mm. Just hold tight. <laughs> yeah, okay, got to eat. Yeah. Yeah. So long story short, um, I had become a believer by this point. And so now I'm also interested in ministry, and I was offered a ministry position. So I could take the ministry position or someday maybe become yeah. a cop. <laughs> Someday, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so guess which one I went with. Yep. And I'm simplifying. It was much more of a struggle than that, and it was a difficult mm -hmm. time. But that's the path I took. I wanted that path. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't just, gee, I'll get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. I was doing ministry already, and I was pursuing that. I just didn't realize I'd be stepping into it full time at mm -hmm. that point. So I went into mm -hmm. ministry, and, um, of course, that got me into firearms. I was already using firearms just for a hobby, but now I learned firearms, mm -hmm. um, ended up in ministry, did that for several years. Um, uh, as we talked, as we mentioned, uh, during that time as a person, I just decided to take up martial arts and ended up becoming a second degree black belt in jujitsu, mm -hmm. taught jujitsu with some Krav Maga yeah, sprinkled my, in. My mm. dad and Morgan, they always wanted to do that because yeah. we had someone in our church who did that. Cause that's in the Israeli defense force, right? They do mm -hmm. Krav Maga. Cool. Yeah, and Krav Maga is basically mixed martial arts, you know, Jewish yeah. style. It, it, it's an emphasis on street practicality and, you know, the, the army puts in how to take away rifles and how to use your rifle in self-defense. Mm -hmm. Also, as the average person may not learn that in their Krav Maga mm -hmm. class. But yeah, Krav Maga is cool. Uh, Jiu Jitsu is cool. Both together are the yeah, best yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's cool. And then where's the scuba? Where did that come? To? Is, that, is that false information? Oh, yeah. I, I, did, I was not a scuba okay. instructor, but I did get scuba oh, certified. Cool. Uh, I used to live by the beach, and I always thought about it. But remember I told you I was looking for hobbies? I think I, uh, I, think I got scuba certified before I got back into yeah. acting, mm -hmm. looking for that hobby. I uh, loved scuba diving. But, you know, living in Tucson doesn't give you a Not lot of really. opportunities no, to die. Desert. Drought. No. Yeah, I traveled a lot. And when I traveled, if I could scuba, I would scuba. Yeah. But I needed more living in the yeah, desert, yeah. you know. That's funny. Yeah. But um, the other thing, Morgan mentioned it a little bit. But what was that like? Okay, so you're 18. And then your family, were they still Orthodox Jews? And what was that transition with your family? Because you grew up. That was awkward. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was it was uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. yeah, my my grandparents gave me grief. Um, some of my parents gave me grief. You know, part part of the family gave yeah. me grief. It was it was awkward. It was uncomfortable, unpleasant, and I was walking on eggshells for quite a while. But as I progressed as an adult, as I progressed in ministry, um, I started writing uh, articles for the Good News newspaper there in Tucson. I had some radio interviews had my own radio show, ended up on TV, produced uh, 100 episodes of talk shows from a Jewish or Messianic Jewish and Christian perspective, uh, had my kids bar mitzvah, led a successful Messianic synagogue. These are the things that my parents mm -hmm. saw. Mm -hmm. So they went from a disrespect to a mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. And also times changed, you know. When I was a kid, there weren't a lot of people mm -hmm. like me, and the world wasn't as open-minded as it mm -hmm. is now. So they went through the change of the world, my growing up, having a family, doing things that they found were impressive, mm -hmm. and it all it, it ended up being good. They Most of my family visited my congregation more than one time, uh, saw what we were doing, and praise God, I was able to, to witness to oh, most Christ, of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And then we, what is the other thing that I want to say? With the, um, so you speak Hebrew or just no a lot of Hebrew or how is that? I <laughs> like the scuba diving thing and like the firearms thing. I just, I, I visited Hebrew, okay. Israel and I thought I'd like to learn Hebrew. 
So I bought uh, a study. And when I was driving in my car back and forth to work and around town and to Phoenix, I'd throw in CDs and I'd learn Hebrew. And I got to a place where I could speak it a little better than a beginner, but by no means fluent. Mm -hmm. But when I went to Israel, I was able to ask for directions and, you know, make my needs yeah. known. But I can't sit down with a Hebrew speaker and have a conversation no. either. So, <laughs> yep. wow. that would be difficult. I know that's the one place I was supposed to go a couple of years ago, Morgan and mm -hmm. I. But then, with everything going on, I mean, it's crazy now. But then, like, yeah. it's even more so. But then, so they cancel the trip, and so we're all bummed. But <laughs> my dad is gone, and my mom. But one day. Yeah. yeah. If not, but yeah, you got it. The only go. place because I'm like I've never go. we've never even been out of the country, never even been to Mexico, so I'm like I just want to go to Israel. That's it. Mm. Okay, you live in Tucson. And I know. Never been to I Mexico? know. We never. No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yep. We Are just... we missing a lot? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, go. Yeah. I know. One day. Yeah. But um, the other thing is, is that we saw a video of you saying the. What is the the blessing? Um, but the it was, Aaronic blessing yeah, from Numbers for your, your congregation. Mm -hmm. And so, what was that like? Was it because you did it every single after every service? Was that correct? Yeah. And so, yeah. What was that like? Um, just leading your congregation and saying that. Um, yeah. Was it emotional? Was it something that the people like? Obviously, it blessed them. But <laughs> what can yeah. you share a little bit more about that? Um, there is liturgy that's part of the Jewish way of worship. And, um, but it's not customary in the synagogue to hear the Aaronic mm -hmm. benediction, but I decided I would make it customary at our congregation. There were also people who encouraged me to do so. And if I ever skipped it, they'd come up to me afterwards and say, Hey, you forgot you forgot. oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. They, they loved yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoyed doing it. I can't think sometimes liturgy can become yeah. rote and monotonous and you just are used mm -hmm. to doing it. But I don't think that ever was the case with the ironic mm -hmm. benediction. I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed chanting and singing and blessing the mm -hmm. people the way God told Aaron and his sons to, to bless mm -hmm. the people. It's kind of like the Lord's prayer. It just yeah, felt yeah. right. It is. I know it's so beautiful and it bless it. It blesses a lot of people, yeah. but I'm going to People like to be blessed. They do. The number <laughs> like, six, the one we're talking about six, mm -hmm. 22 through 26. Um, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, the Lord lift you up in his countenance, countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm. And that's what the congregation was too, right? Beth is house. And then is it Sar, right? And then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sar, Shalom. Shalom. So the house of um, the Prince of Peace, right? Is that what it's called? You got it. Very so good. So yeah. I just thought that was so cool because that's what a lot of people need today is their... Mm -hmm depressed, overwhelmed, anxious, um, and especially everything with COVID and all the craziness, all the suicide and all the things that these kids are going through. Um, that's what they really need. They need peace, but they're trying to find it right in everything but Jesus, but the Lord. And so I kind of want to segue a little bit into the chosen and how mm -hmm. powerful that is, especially during this time. Is Can when I say a lot of people, one thing real quick? Of course before that because she was talking about peace and it's cool in the new testament you see grace and peace mm -hmm. you know in the introductions of like books and stuff and uh it's sad because like in, in judaism it's all sacrifices and yeah. and all these rules and different things but i like what one pastor says it's always grace and mm -hmm. then peace because if you don't understand the yes. grace of God, then you're not going to have that peace from God, you know, because you're going to always keep going through the do's, do's, you know, and my dad always says it ends up making you feel like doo-doo, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just feel like I can't, <laughs> do -do. I can't live up to this, you know, yeah. it's just too much. But that grace yeah. really leads to peace or shalom, right? So, yeah. But you, you make a good point, too, unless a person knows mm -hmm all those do's and don'ts they won't they may not come to the point of yeah. conviction where they look for yeah. the grace so the law is wonderful it's not obsolete it's a useful tool if i can use yeah. that word yeah. to show people how sinful we yeah. are so that we, we might realize we need yeah. grace Amen. so the schoolmaster yeah Amen. teaches us that yeah. we need that grace so yeah. 
Sorry, exactly. didn't want to. No, no that's chosen. good because that's what yeah. you're talking about. Is like you in the role of chosen. We're going to talk about how you got into that first, and then you were um, a disciple of Nicodemus, so a Pharisee, mm. which. The Pharisees, right? They knew all the law, the Torah, the 613, like, <laughs> commands. Like, that is, I can't even, a lot of people wow. can't even remember the Ten Commandments, <laughs> let alone 613. Yeah. So, first of all, let's start with, how did you get into the role of chosen? How did that come, come up? Well, you know, I got into mm-hmm. acting. And as an actor, we're always networking. And I saw a television, no, a movie called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone by Dallas Mm. Jenkins. And um, I thought it was fabulous. Mm. So I reached out to him and I I introduced myself, told him I thought his show was fabulous. And um, in my mind, I said, I'm going to work with this Mm. man one day because he's he's good at what he does. And this is the kind of stuff I want to do. I want to work with faith-based filmmakers who are good. It's not cheesy. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, not that cheesy stuff. And so after, I don't know, a couple of years, maybe a year after that, uh, this idea of the chosen was born. And I had already been in touch with them. I was like, you realize when this comes about, you got to give me an audition, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course you'll get an audition. Of course you'll get yeah. an audition. So it finally came about and I reminded him. <laughs> <laughs> and by that point, I had an agent and so on and so forth, but we were in personal contact, so. I just reached out to him. He connected me with the casting director and gave me my audition. And I auditioned for a couple of the roles and I ended up with one of the Pharisee yeah. roles. Yeah. That's crazy. And then where was the audition? Like where a lot of people said that it was first in Utah where they filmed and now in Texas or I don't know a lot about that. Um, auditions are usually held remotely. So I taped mm-hmm. myself. Mm. Right. They send me what are called the sides. That's the script they want to see me do. I get somebody to read the other parts for me off camera. So we have their voice. And then I act in front of the camera and then send it off to the casting director. Yeah, usually what what happens when you audition is you never hear back. Mm -hmm. Mm. Nothing. Mm. It's not like, thank you for trying, but we went with somebody else. (laughs) You just don't hear back. Mm. If they're interested, (laughs) they'll either send you an email or phone call to your agent and your agent will say, hey, you booked the role. Or they'll say, hey, we want you to try it again this way or try this other character and try this one. That's called a callback. Mm-hmm. So you audition. If they like your audition, you get a callback. Mm-hmm. You might get multiple callbacks. And then if you make it all the way, then you get you get the role. Oh, wow. cool. Yeah, so, so when did you find out that you got yeah. the role? And what year was this when all this? Gee, I don't know. This has all happened so fast. Year, yeah. It was a little little over two years ago, I think. Hmm. And I was actually, as I mentioned earlier, I was hosting some television programs. So I was brought in as a special host to interview Dallas Jenkins for The Chosen. Hmm. And this was in Texas. And he flew in, we chit-chatted, and he said he, he, he was going to give me a role. Hmm. Oh. But I didn't know at that point what the role was. Hmm. And I don't know if it was through email or a phone call that I later found out what the role was. He sent me the sides and um, asked me if I wanted it. Mm-hmm. And um, I said, yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That's awesome. Okay, so you got the you got the role, and then what did that look like? Did they did you go to Utah, go on the set? And it was uh, different, okay, right, so... from obviously theater and stuff, where it's like you have to memorize everything all at once and all this stuff. But... This wasn't your first film, though, right? You've done... Correct. This was not my first film. Okay. I had already done the feature, the faith-based feature, Amazed by You, mm. which you can see on Amazon Prime or Pure Flix. Mm. And I also did the feature film Fronteras, which is on Netflix, which is not for the faint of heart. It's <laughs> kind of like a drug lord, gun violence oh. kind of movie. Mm. Um, and I have d- did a few commercials. Mm-hmm. So I already knew what I was doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not the most experienced guy out there, but I'd been on set. I knew what to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, they flew me out to uh, a Capernaum Studios in uh, Texas. Mm-hmm. And that's where the first season was filmed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Part of the second season, most of the second season was filmed in Utah. Yeah. And that was on a Mormon set, right? Because I knew a yeah. lot of people were freaking out, thinking like, wait, is this Mormon? Like, is this the whole thing of Chosen? Like, is <laughs> they going to have like a Mormon twist to it? 
and saying like and I was like where are you getting this and I was like oh probably because the set right was is that a Mormon set it was on a set owned by the Church of okay. Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints mm-hmm. uh, com- a couple of the producers are Mormons mm-hmm. but the writers are not yeah. and the showrunner Dallas Jenkins is not yeah. mm-hmm. and the Mormons have no um they don't give any input into the way it's written yeah. mm-hmm. Dallas is very cautious to make it as religiously neutral as possible, but he is an evangelical and not ashamed of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he does talk to people of other religions and wants them to watch it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, And they do. Catholics love it. Mormons love it. Jews love it. Um, everybody seems to love it. Mm-hmm. He's walking a very narrow line, mm-hmm. but one that he put in the sand and he's happy to walk. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it's all good. Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of the the things that people are kind of scared about The Chosen, like I know if there's, when people are like the controversy is stuff, is they're like, well, why don't you just like go straight from the Bible? Why does it have to be like you're like, they feel like, oh, you're adding to it and stuff like that. Like so the what backstory? Would, what? Like backstory you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the backstory. People, do, a lot of people, they're like, oh, I don't think that's right. Like, can you do that? So I know Dallas talks about it and explains it. But can you explain to the listeners who are feeling that and they're like, I can't watch it because they're taking too much liberty on this or that. What does Dallas say and what are your thoughts on it too? Well, my thoughts are on it. If you've ever read a novel that mentions a biblical character Hmm. or ever heard a sermon about a biblical character Hmm. and the pastor said something like, I wonder what it was like for Matthew being a tax collector in Jerusalem or in Capernaum. You realize tax collectors were hated Hmm. This is like that, but a little more. Mm -hmm. This does not claim to be the Bible. This isn't a Bible story. Mm -hmm. This is not the book of Matthew. Mm -hmm. This is a drama, a fictitious drama about um, biblical characters Mm -hmm. with some of the Bible story woven into it. So Dallas's claim and desire is when he addresses the Bible, he wants to be as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. But the whole thing is just, it's a fiction. And... It introduces people to Jesus in a beautiful way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if Christians are uncomfortable watching fiction that addresses the Bible, that's cool. Don't watch it. Mm-hmm. But please understand, that's all it is. And if you're comfortable watching fiction of anything else, <laughs> rejoice that somebody's doing fiction honoring God in the Bible, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's good. Yeah. I think of like how Paul says, at least Christ is being preached. You yeah. know, yeah. like it's funny yeah. how I've. I've heard even some pastors like putting down the chosen and I'm like, this isn't the Bible, but I know I've heard of them like watching other things that I'm like, you should probably shouldn't be watching that as a Christian yet. They they're putting down the chosen. And I'm like, how does that work? You know? So yeah, from what I've seen, it's been, it's been good. It's been right on with the Bible and everything. And yeah, there's backstory, but I like that because it kind of makes you think of, uh, like what maybe they might have been thinking back then, you know, and I just posted mm-hmm. and this is one of thousands, literally thousands of thousands of similar stories. Mm-hmm. I just posted the fan club page, an atheist who saw the show and says now he believes Jesus. Oh, he didn't say, oh, I'm born again now. Mm-hmm. He just went from a real core, solid core atheist to, you know what? I think I believe in this Jesus yeah. after watching The Chosen. Thousands and thousands and thousands of stories like yeah. this. Plus Christians who have fallen away from the Lord, who have come back. Mm -hmm. Uh, This show is a gift from God, and it's it's sad when people can't see that. Mm -hmm. But as Dallas says, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I would throw a a warning out there from a guy who plays a Pharisee on TV. (laughs) (laughs) Pastors, don't be a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. That's good. I know. There's like the Pharisees, my dad always talks about it. They're the ones, when you think about it, They thought they were right on. They were the ones who were set apart and stuff. So back Mm -hmm. then, they weren't as like it was these people. They looked up to the Pharisees and these are the people who they knew like, right? You had to like know the first five books and like they knew the word of God, but yet they missed Jesus. And so that's the thing. So many times, like I love that you said that because pastors Mm -hmm. like They can look good on the outside, right? Jesus said that to the Pharisees. You whitewash tombs. You look good on the outside, but the inside, dead man's bones, you guys. uh, And so 
that's where actually I've realized growing up in church and in ministry, mm-hmm. I've kind of been very pharisaical, like being like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that person. And actually you were in that scene, right? When they were um, going to the tax, Matthew's house and they're like with the tax collector, the prostitutes. What? Yeah, and I was. it's mm-hmm. kind of like, ugh, like yeah. Jesus, like how could you do that? But that's what a lot of Christians do. They're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're talking to them or that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Yes, we shouldn't just be doing things with them and partying with them. Like, because some people, they go to bars and then they're like, oh, I'm ministering. And they're not ministering. They're just doing exactly what they're doing. (laughs) But Jesus, right, when he was there, he changed the room. Like, Mm -hmm. he changed the atmosphere. So can you share a little bit more of that, of, like, Pharisees and what that was like? And what what do you mean by saying, like, we shouldn't be pastors and Mm -hmm. just Christians. We should be careful of being like the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. I think pastors are in a more difficult position Mm -hmm. because we are gatekeepers to orthodoxy. It's our job every day to keep the dirt out. And so sometimes we might build those walls just a little too high and be a little too careful that we don't let the good in too. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to be mean about it. Pastors keep being the gatekeepers, but don't keep the gate shut. Let the good stuff through. Yeah. And um, chosen is good stuff. It's blessing so many people. And you're right. I loved how you said it. Jesus would have gone to the bars, but he would have changed the room. That's cool. I like that saying. Thank you. That's what my dad did. He actually, in Tucson, went to, it was a gay bar. um, And everyone was like, what are you doing? My dad's like, I I did not want to go. He's like, but he ministered to these transvestites who were just like so lost, so hurt. And they said, if we ever were to go to a church or like want to know Jesus, we you're someone who we know you care about us and love us. Yeah. And my dad, that's what my dad says. He says, we don't agree with your lifestyle, but we love you as a person. And we mm-hmm. want to pray for, is it the Matthew, is it Matthew 6? Or no, Matthew 6, 1 Corinthians 6, right? Such words about what? You. Oh, yeah. Hey, you can just do it what the biblical writers do. It is written. It is written. Yeah, it is written. I know it's on our church though, yeah. so I'm like, I just get confused I think with it's 6, 13 6, or six but, eleven. But just that you were fornicators, you were adulterers, mm-hmm. you were drunkards, but such were some of you. That's the power of Jesus, what he does. Yeah. And I also want to talk about this because um the new episode with Mary, a lot of people are freaking out about because <laughs> she's right, she had seen Jesus, she's been walking with Jesus, but she goes back. She goes back a little bit and goes to a tavern, right, and gambles. And can you explain that, like, the freak out that people are having? Like, if you had seen Jesus, you wouldn't do that. And <laughs> Dallas then explains. And then people get mad at Dallas because they're like, he was too intense. And then they're accusing <laughs> Dallas of basically saying, oh, it's fine. You can sin. And people are like, doesn't Paul say, we um, should we sin that grace might abound? By no means. Mm-hmm. But I think what Dallas is basically trying to explain, we're going to slip up. He he even admitted that he had struggled as a Christian with pornography and it hurt his family. His wife talks about it. But that doesn't mean he's not saved. It's just saying mm-hmm. to the day we die, the Holy Spirit sanctifying us and mm-hmm. cleansing us. These, these people that are upset, mm-hmm. and I think they're min- the vocal minority for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They need to lighten up. Yeah. It's, you know, people are so uptight and then they vocalize and try to get other people uptight oftentimes without thinking things through Hmm. Uh, and if they thought it through maybe they wouldn't feel that way but then some still would and that's just the way it is there's you know there's people who will be our friends and people who will annoy us they're easy to get along with people and there's annoying people there's good people there's bad people there's uptight people Um, the chosen is a big tent Hmm. And some people will come under that tent and just not fit in. Mm. But most people will. You know, trying to please everybody, ha. Huh? <laughs> How many denominations and different churches do we have? And then those churches split. And those churches that split, split. Mm. People forget what the grace of God's all about. Yeah. I like to tell people the two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart. Love others as you love yourselves. Mm. After you get those down, then we can argue about the other stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. But until you have that down, I don't want to argue about the other stuff. Yeah. Agree on the essentials, like my dad says. We're going to disagree on the non-essentials. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But with the, with the Mary thing, yeah, it's it's very. It hurt them to see this person close to Jesus step away. Mm. Yeah. 
And I think it was their insecurity and their lack of biblical knowledge that upset them, thinking Dallas wrote something heretical and his team. Hmm. But when he explains it and when you think about it, people backslide. Yeah. It happens yeah. all the time. Mm-hmm. Ask King David. He'll tell you yeah. all about it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yep, it's true. Yeah. Did you and, have any other um, I, Oh, yeah. I wanted to talk about a little bit more about the religiosity, like we like to call it, um, that, that pharisaical heart where mm-hmm. it's like, because I, I've dealt with that just like Mariah was saying, because we've been raised in the church. Yeah. Me me and Mariah, we're brother and sister. And it's, we we've live been, holy lives. yeah, we want to look good and we want to, you know, we don't want to give a bad name to my dad, Pastor Craig, and different things like that. But we need to make sure that we're not just doing it to go through the motions or to, mm-hmm. to put on a, an outward appearance that looks good. Because, like Mariah was saying, the whitewashed tombs, you have dead bones inside and so we we've had to do that because we had to look at ourselves and like am i being pharisaical am i am i just putting on a show so how because you were a pastor too so how was that for you how did you um, make sure that you weren't just becoming a pharisee because Mm -hmm. i don't think the pharisees are like hoping to miss miss the truth you know they're i i believe they're devout and they're trying to find the truth nicodemus yeah so how did you hey the struggle is real you know and i don't want to downplay it for any christian Mm -hmm. because we know there's a standard Mm -hmm. and that standard is perfection yeah be holy even as the lord your god is holy and so we put up these walls and we drive a stake in the ground and say i'm not moving past this stake Mm -hmm. which is good but we become stubborn and callous mm. and kind of legalistic about that stake we just drove in the ground. Mm. So what was there to honor God becomes a trap. Yeah. And it doesn't allow us to see grace and mercy. Mm-hmm. And we get scared yeah. subconsciously that somebody's going to move us from that stake. Mm-hmm. So we get all holier than now for our own selves to keep ourselves by that stake. So we're not tempted to step away. Yeah. But in doing so, we become kind of loveless. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So the struggle is real, but I just think we have to keep in mind the two greatest commandments. Mm -hmm. Love God, love others. Mm -hmm. Love over law, Mm -hmm. not law over love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's been hard for me. Sometimes even when I teach on grace, you know, I'm like, oh, man, I I try to say, well, but you're supposed to do do this and be, you know, not just abuse grace. But Mm -hmm. if we truly understand the grace of God then it's not we're not going to abuse it i think but and so we need to be careful not to go from one extreme to the other and that's as humans that's what we're tempted to do and that's why Mm -hmm. we always say here that's why we need the holy spirit to lead us and to keep us uh grounded and to keep us in that balance so and that's the other thing cool about when you say you know, you say the struggle is real. You're right. It is a struggle. Mm-hmm. As long as we don't quit. Yeah. Just keep struggling. Exactly. Yeah. Like, sometimes we'll get it right. Forward. Sometimes we'll get it wrong. But if we're going to make a mistake, make a mistake on the side of love. Yeah. That's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what's cool about the chosen is you see that they made a mistake. But I love when Mary, Jesus' mom, oh, Mary, she was like, should I see him now? And she's like, yes. Like, you need to see him now. Like, don't have to clean up. I know you just were just in sin, but you don't have to clean up. Just go to him. And mm-hmm. he's there to forgive you. And that's what the whole chosen series is about like you just see the intimacy that the disciples have with jesus Mm -hmm. like and jesus laughing with the kids that's one of my favorites when he's with the little (laughs) kids or um the woman at the well like the samaritan woman that touches my heart Mm -hmm. and there's just so many scenes where you just realize oh my goodness jesus like you see because sometimes growing up and like knowing don't do this don't do that you sometimes think like god's a god he is a god discipline But sometimes you forget the side of love, too, where it's like, no, he does love. He does care. He does walk them through it. They keep falling, you know, and James and John, sons of thunder, they they (laughs) get a little uppity, but he he lovingly rebukes them. Mm -hmm. And so I just that's what I love, the how people can relate. It's not just, oh, the Bible, a book that was written like thousands of years ago. It's real for us today. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so powerful is that it's not about do's and don'ts and like all obeying the 613 laws it's about that it's done like when Mm -hmm. jesus died on the cross right the veil was torn Mm -hmm. and now we can go to him one-on-one we can talk to him and that's just what's so beautiful about this story but so what are some of the scenes that you're in are you going to be in scenes in the future 
with The Chosen? And what does that look like for you? I'm in season one, episode four and episode eight. Mm -hmm. In episode four, I'm with Nicodemus and Shmuel and the other rabbis talking about John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And then, as you mentioned, in episode eight, I'm with um, one of the rabbis and all the disciples who are with Jesus at Matthew's dinner party. And um, I'm hoping to be in other Mm -hmm. seasons. There's a good chance I'll be in other seasons. But only God knows. Mm-hmm. Well, God and maybe Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I would love to be in other seasons. And I, it's my prayer and my hope that they'll take my character and breathe more depth into him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, because he hasn't developed like Nicodemus to approve of Jesus or like Shmuel to reject Jesus. Mm-hmm. He's been a thoughtful Pharisee. He's... Mm-hmm was upset that he was with Matthew, but then when Jesus explained himself, he th- he listened to it. Yeah. Yeah. He thought about it. And so he's out there in the ether now. Which way is he going to yeah. go? I'm dying to see. Yeah, yeah. that's exciting. <laughs> God only knows. But, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, do you have anything else? Well, the last thing I also want to share is for those who have family members who are, are you know, just the orth- – right? Is that orthodox? I don't, I don't want to mess it up. But like Ben Shapiro, right? He's an orthodox Jew where – he mm-hmm. doesn't believe mm-hmm. that Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, is the Son of God. Or Dennis and like, Prager. Uh, Prager. Prager actually said, right? I don't want to butcher it. I think Prager said, if if Jesus comes um, he's and gonna he's him. like, he's going to ask him, have you been here before <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> yeah. And then he would believe. Oh, but yeah. 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 Well, hopefully they'll come aboard before yeah. then. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So <laughs> what is some, because like I always think, oh, it's so easy. Just read Isaiah 53. That's it. But what is that? Like, how can we pray for the Jews and also the Jews in Israel, too? Because we're supposed to, as Christians, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and everything. Um, mm-hmm. What is some some wisdom and some things that we can do? As the scripture says, that their uh, minds might be open, their eyes would be, that that mm-hmm. flesh, that veil would be torn off of their eyes and that they could see the mm-hmm. truth. Isaiah 53 is powerful, and anytime you have an oppor- opportunity to, to share the gospel with a Jewish person, I would recommend looking at Isaiah 53. Mm-hmm. But we have to understand the first thing is the Holy Spirit has to mm-hmm. touch them, mm-hmm. and there's nothing we can do about yeah, that. That's true. Mm-hmm. But pray. Mm-hmm. That's good. So by all means, pray that their eyes would be opened, and then when you have an opportunity, start with Isaiah 53 and see what the Holy Spirit does. Yeah. Is that true that I've heard somewhere that that was like a forbidden text or something yeah. or it yeah. not that it's wrong but that i think they're saying oh it just confuses too many people like they think it's about jesus but it's really about israel you know so was is it really forbidden like that it's not forbidden in the sense of some rabbi saying hey you can't read that it's just left out oh, okay so when you like go through the, most of the bible in the synagogue through the yearly reading cycle that's passed over. It's not in this reading cycle (laughs) and it's not talked about. And yes, they will say it refers to the nation of Israel, not the Messiah. And if you are more educated, you would know that. (laughs) Yeah. But that, that's, you know, something they might say, but read it that just tell people to read it because it's very obvious. It's, Mm -hmm. it's not talking about the nation of Israel. It's, it, it, it's ridiculous to think it's talking about the nation of Israel. It goes against all rules of grammar to think yeah. that. Yeah. It's obviously talking about an individual. It makes that very clear. Mm-hmm. And then you have to decide intellectually if you're going to go with the party line, mm-hmm. the spin, or go with what it plainly says. Mm-hmm. I went with what it plainly said. Mm-hmm. And that was part of the one of the main reasons I became a follower of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, I've yeah. seen a video where this guy um, goes to Israel Mm -hmm. and he reads it to them or he lets them read it in in Hebrew and everything like that. And then um, just people are crying crying. and people are like, uh, at the end he says, who who is this? Who is this talking about? And they're like, Jesus, you Mm -hmm. know, and it's just so cool to see that. And yeah, I've done that many times too. I just say, here, read this. And I wouldn't tell them what it was and they would read it and they might say something like that's from the new Testament. (laughs) And I'm like, no, that's from the Jewish Bible. Yeah. And they go, no, it's not. Yeah, that, That's a different Bible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nope. Well, I'm going to go home and look at my Bible, <laughs> the one they got from their grandparents. I'm going to go talk to my rabbi. Mm-hmm. It touches everybody. Yeah. It's powerful. It's it's definitely worth reading mm-hmm. for sure. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We yeah. got a lot of insight from you. And 
um, a lot of wisdom. And is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners? Yes, thank you for asking. A couple of things. First of all, I got a movie coming out in October, oh, cool. hitting theaters October 9th called The Righteous 12. Oh, cool. You can follow me on social media to learn more about that and see the trailer. Yeah. Um, probably going to be a premiere in the Tucson area, either Tucson or Tombstone. Might be one in Hollywood. I'm not sure yet, but be on the lookout for The Righteous 12. Also, The Chosen. Um, there's a couple different ways to watch that. Peacock TV has it, so you can just watch it, I think, for free on Peacock. Um, I'm in an episode of Mr. Mayor with Ted Danson on NBC on Peacock as well. So you can do a Peacock Charmette night if you want to. <laughs> yeah. And then um, you can just download the Chosen app onto your smartphone. It's free. Yeah. And then you can cast it to your TV. It's free, but you have the opportunity to do what we call pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Pay for it so people in China and in India and people in the United States who can't afford it, it's free. But it perpetuates yeah. it. It's how it's paid for. Mm -hmm. So download the Chosen app, pay it forward, watch it on Peacock TV. And um, anything else you want to follow, you can follow me on social media or on my IMDB page. And you'll see the projects on there. We'll cool. put all of that in the description below. So everyone go check out all of that Thank stuff. You. But Thank Steve, you. again, thanks so much for joining us. We had a blessed conversation mm -hmm. with you. My pleasure. Honored to do it. Hopefully we can do it again someday. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us, wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much to our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please go check them out in the description below. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless.